Today's scripture reading is from Ephesians 3.20 to 4.3 and can be found on page 1037 of the Bible at your seat. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. This is the word of the Lord. We have a wonderful Savior and Lord. It's fun to sing about the work of the Lord, not only what we see him doing in our community and throughout all the world, but just to sing of what the work of the Lord is doing in our own hearts, in our minds, our families. Uh, each week when we come and look at the text and look at what God is doing in the text, we want to submit ourselves to the word of the Lord. And so that's why we say, uh, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, because without his word speaking to us, we would have no compass, no direction in our lives. So it's a good thing. Scripture is amazing. It's God's spoken word for us. God didn't have to speak. He didn't owe us words. It is his spoken word for us. And oftentimes what we try to do here every Sunday morning is, is look at the text and bring it alive. And, and what we really want to do is sort of the vision, preaching vision of our church is to preach through books of the Bible. Uh, but this particular series, what we're doing is we are uh, sort of looking at different texts that highlight an attribute of God. And we are going through this series entitled Knowing God, or we've called it Behold our God. And sometimes what will happen when we try to do this, I'll highlight a text and we'll present the text and then I'll preach the text and, and I'll realize that on Sunday evening or Monday morning that, that it just felt incomplete. And it doesn't mean that we were wrong. It doesn't mean that I was wrong. It doesn't mean, but it just, there's a feeling of like there's more there. There's, there's more that the text is saying that I want us to, to feast on, to enjoy, and to digest. And, and I felt that this last week. I, I want us to enjoy, and I want myself to enjoy thoroughly what this text is saying about God. I want us to apply it practically. I want to truly grab hold of this truth. And if I'm being really honest, the way I pray it is, I want this truth to really grab hold of you. And so this feeling of incompleteness happened when I was thinking about this. I didn't realize what it was until I, I read the discussion guide. And I don't know if you know this, but for our community groups, we write a discussion guide, talking points that every group can use as a guide to walk through. Well, recently, Daniel has started writing those for us. And, and if you've noticed, Daniel kind of will sit back there and in the middle of the sermon, and he's writing his thoughts out and using the discussion guide. Well, at the end of this week's, this last week's discussion guide, he had a a little additional resources that we can go and look up and if you don't know that this guide is there you can go to our website look at resources sermons and under each sermon there's a link there and you can just click on that discussion guide you don't have to be a community group leader to click on that link that's for everybody well at this particular discussion guide I clicked on the link I was reading it before we released it to go public and I saw at the very bottom this article written by Sam Storms. And at the very bottom of that article about the omnipotence of God, I noticed what I was missing, what I felt incomplete. And it was this practical application of this one verse in Ephesians 3.20. It was basically six points delivered by John Stott. And so what we're going to do today is I am going to borrow five of the six points of John Stott, and I'm going to just say from the beginning, full disclosure, that the five points that you're about to hear are not mine, they're John Stott's, but I liked them enough and said, this is good for us, I'm going to present them to you, but I, we are going to unpack it together, and then we're going to move toward our time of communion, applying this for our 
lives. Last week, we were reminded throughout the text that God is able. That's sort of the attribute that we're looking at, that God is omnipotent, that He is able. What we looked at last week is that He is able to change us, that He never changes. He is sovereign. He is all-seeing. He is all-wise. He is holy. Those are things we've looked at over the last several weeks. But last week we looked at this text and what, what I focused in on was more about what His attribute of, of ability will do for us. And this week what I'm realizing is we need to really camp out on what this is saying about Him. So we're going to look at these five points together And we're going to declare, hopefully together, at our time of communion, that God is able. Holy God, you are so good to us. And I pray that you would, for every one of us in this place, no matter how we've entered this room, fully knowledgeable or a lot knowledgeable or a skeptic that's just wondering and kicking the tires and asking questions. However we have entered this room, oh God, you know it. You're all wise. And I pray that we would be convinced that you, oh God, are omnipotent. That you, oh God, are able. In Jesus' name, teach us. Amen. God is able. First of all, we see in this text in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that He is able to do. He is able to work. Now to Him who is able to do. So Jason, we, we know that, right? Our God is not an idle God. He is not a God who says, I don't, I don't want you to bother me. He's not a God that says, I've done my work. I've created what I'm going to create. I'm kicking it back in the easy chair, and y'all just figure this out. No, this is a God who does not sleep or slumber, which is what we see in Psalm 121. He is not a God that's just so proud of His creation that He boasts in what He did. He's a God that says, I am so active and working that even the rocks will come forth and declare my glory because I am working still. He is able to do. He is able to do means He is able to to work. That means He's not too busy for us. That means He's not overwhelmed by us. He doesn't have too much on His plate. What do you get like whenever you have so much going on? You get stressed. You start to maybe fall apart, right? That's why we need a Sabbath. We can't handle seven on, seven on, seven on, seven on, seven on. We need a day of rest. We need a day to say, okay, I need to be still and I need to recognize my inability and His ability to keep working. God never tires. How many times have we said, well, I don't want to bother the man upstairs. Don't say that around me. You're going to get a bad thing of me coming out when you say that. I would just, God is able. He doesn't see busyness like we see it. He is working. He is able to always work. Moses cried out to him in Exodus 15, 6, Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Your right hand is glorious in power. Moses is declaring like, I have seen you do what I can't believe I've seen you do. You have done things in me. You've changed me. You've changed our people. You're changing Pharaoh. You're changing all this stuff. Your, your, your right hand has done way more than I could imagine. God is able to do. In Job we read that His power is vast. In Psalm we read that the Lord is strong and mighty. Our God is a God who is able to work to accomplish His will. The second thing we see in this text is that He is also able to do all that we ask. 
he's able to do what we ask. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask. What does this mean for us? Well, it shows us and it reminds us what Paul is saying. is God is a God who listens to us. He hears us. When we need to approach Him, we can approach Him through through Jesus Christ. That's what we just sang about. That's what this communion, Lord's Supper, means. Is that through Christ, we have access to the Father. He is ready to listen to us. He did not allow His Son to die on the cross to then close His ears to the ones that Jesus saved. He wants you talking to Him. Wherever you are on your relationship with the Lord, wherever the journey is, you could be in the the valley of the shadow of death. You could be on the, the summit of your experiences in life right now. He wants you talking to Him. He is a God who listens. Our God is working. He is able to accomplish what we bring to Him and ask of Him. And thirdly, He's able to also do not only what we ask, but what we think. Now, ponder that. And as you're pondering that, God already knew what was on your mind as you're pondering it. Even when we fail to ask Him, He doesn't stop working. He is working. And He is moving to do. He is working. Again, we see God's omniscience here. We looked at this a few weeks ago. What His wisdom is. We see His wisdom being applied with His omnipotence, His ability. He knows what's on our minds. He knows what our goals are. He knows our deep longings. Yes, God wants us talking to Him. He wants us coming, just like every father wants their children coming and saying, God, Dad, here's my needs. Here's what I want. Here's what I need. God wants that. But just like earthly fathers... We're going to work to take care of our children even if they don't ask for air conditioning that day. How many of you, as your children, did they say, hey, I need a, a lunch made for me in the morning. I need waffles in the morning. I need, and then they make these requests every day. No, sometimes they'll ask it once and then they just assume it, right, the rest of the time? Sometimes we don't come before the Father and ask Him things. He knows what we need. He knows what we're thinking Our Heavenly Father is providing daily. He's providing. He is doing for His children even when we don't ask for it. He knows what's on our thoughts. This text, some translations say, um, all that we ask or imagine. It's not just what you're currently thinking. It's what you, whatever you can imagine. God knows your thoughts. He knows your heart even before you ask it, even while you're asking it, even if you don't ask it, God is working. He is able, He is not limited by our inability to ask Him. He is able to work even still. We might have the inability, we don't know what to say. We can apply this reality just by going to the Lord and saying, God, You know my thoughts, You know my heart." my heart, I don't even know what to ask about this situation I'm in. It's it's too overwhelming for me. I don't even know what I need. I pray that prayer almost every Monday morning. God, this week, I don't even know what it is I need this week. But, But you know, would you please work? Would you work, please? You can pray prayers like that and it acknowledges Him as a God who's not idle, a God who is able to work and do whatever we ask and whatever we think. But this text also reminds us, this is all in verse 20 still, He is able to do all that we ask or think. Now to Him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, or all that we ask or imagine. This speaks to his competency. He knows how to do everything that we would even imagine. 
all that we can ask of God, He is able to accomplish. Have you ever had one of your children come up to you and ask you, um, uh, Mom, Dad, uh, I need this, and the first thought that comes to your mind is like, man, I forgot how to do algebra a long time ago. And here's what I had to say to my daughter who entered, I think it was 7th grade or 8th grade, whenever algebra was, I don't even know. I'm, I'm, I'm involved with my kids' lives, I promise. But I remember thinking, okay, my daughter's going to start asking me questions about math. I don't know any, I forgot math. I don't like, I know, I got fingers. Like, so I, I went and bought a book. And immediately, because I realized how much more competent my wife is at math than me, that book just sort of went to the top shelf. But as a dad, I was willing to learn how to help my daughter. God doesn't have to learn anything. He's able to help us in all things. I remember asking my dad a long time ago, Dad, can you build me a fort? I don't remember my dad at the moment saying, get out of here, son. That's a dumb question. I've never built anything like that in my life. I do remember my dad, comically so, working to learn how to build a fort. And he's an earthly person. I'm an earthly person. And even in our love for our children, we're going to strive to try to learn how to help them. God does not have to learn anything. He is able to do all that we ask or think he is able always always you're not going to stump god god's ability to do all that we ask isn't just a matter of can you it's also a matter of will you just because this says that he is able to do all that we ask or think doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to do all that we ask or think. We need to understand this. Just like a child says, Dad, would you buy me a pool? Well, I probably could maybe buy a home with a pool. But it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. It's a matter of not just can you, will you. We need to stop asking if God can and just start asking, God, what is your will? Because we know you can. You are able to, to do all that I ask or think. There might be times that God has cho chosen to say no to all that we ask or think. God, can you remove my boss? Of course he can, but will he? God, can you provide me a 4,000 square foot home, six bedrooms, six baths? Well, of course he can, but will he? Is that really what's best for you? God, can you help my team win? Well, of course he can. Will he? And that's all comical, but in real life, we know the things that we really want to ask him. God, can you keep Satan and evil from ever touching me and my family? Well, of course he can. Will he? You're saying, wait a minute, Jason. Our vision of this and the reality is that he allowed evil to come and touch his own son. We see in Job, the book of Job, that he is able to shorten the leash that he has on Satan. He can. He is able all the time. But there are things happening in his wisdom that we can't fathom. Will he? God, can you remove the arthritis in my knee? Can you remove the cancer? Can you remove? Yes, God is able to do all that we ask or imagine. But will he? We don't know. We know that those who are in Christ will see the answer to be a glorious yes one day where there will be no more weeping no more crying no more pains no more struggling and until that day we don't know if the answer is going to come sooner or we're going to have to wait till eternity but he is able even though 
we have no as an answer sometimes. God remains able to do all that we ask in him. The fifth thing we see in this just one verse 20, that he is not only able to do all that we ask or think, he is able to do way more than we ask or think. Now to him who is able to do, and you thought I was just skipping by this quickly, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, or all that we ask and imagine. This is amazing for us, and it should be so much good news for us. Some translations say far above. Some translations say exceedingly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. But it means exactly what you think it means. Some of you have some crazy imaginations. I've heard you. You come to the table and say, I want to tell you, I don't want to freak you out. You're not going to freak me out. Well, even if I do this, you're not freaking God out. Because he can do way above and beyond anything that you can ever ask of him. Again, we look to the cross. Who would have ever planned the rescuing of sinners that way? So this morning, what I want to ask you to do is, will you believe with me that God's expectations are higher than ours? Would you agree with me and believe with me that his vision for our lives, his vision for this community is bigger and grander than ours? Would you agree with that with me? Then, you're like, oh, he tricked me. Then would you also believe with me that he is able to meet his own expectations? Okay, that sounds like we just declared, a few of us who said yes, that he is able far beyond our asking and thinking. He is able to do everything that he wants to accomplish. That's really good news for us. Even if at times we are wondering Why, God, is this happening? Our thoughts are limited. Our wildest dreams are limited. Even if we asked or imagined the grandest thing, God goes beyond. He is able to go far above, far beyond, even though for now the answer might be no. He is preparing something better. Something grander. Something that will fulfill his will, his expectations, which then as his children, I know this, a happy dad, a happy mom raises up happy children. And if God is going to work toward his good pleasure, guess what that means for his children? The greatest of all pleasures. God is working He is doing. He is able to work and do all that we ask or think. And he's able to go exceedingly far beyond anything you ask or think. Those are the five sort of John's thought points that I wanted to highlight. And we celebrate that God is omnipotent. He is able. But you notice that we asked Holly to read more than just verse 20. There's some application here that will prepare us to do communion together. Like I said, my desire is to preach through Ephesians. We're probably going to do that next year, Lord willing, or start it next year. You know how I preach through. It takes a while. But we're going to start it next year. But in this context, how dare we just read verse 20 and not look at the next chapter? Chapter 4 helps us with the context. When we read this scripture, we must read and apply within the context of this book. And here's, let's listen to what Paul says. I'm going to read verse 20 again, then I'm going to go all the way down to verse, chapter 4, verse 3. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church 
and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 4. Therefore. So since we believe that God can meet His own expectations, since we believe that He is able, therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received. How? With patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. What Paul is saying here. In a way, because he is able, A, we can live out our calling, even from a prison. You've got to be thinking that Paul, at some point, talked to the Father and said, okay, God, I'm going on this journey. I pray that nothing bad happens to us. I pray that I don't get arrested. I pray that nothing comes my way that's going to hinder. You've got to know that Paul probably asked that to God. All that he asked, God is able to do. But yet, he's in prison. And he, from prison, is declaring God is able to carry out what he wants to carry out. He is able to carry out a worthy calling even here. Because he is able, we can live out our calling. That's A, because he is able, we can live out our calling in a worthy manner. This is where we really start to apply theology. The orthodoxy becomes orthopraxy and stuff like this. When we begin to practice, here's what Paul says. Here's how, or here's what a worthy manner living calling looks like. He says by verse 2, he says, being patient with one another. Some of you might, some of us might really struggle with this. Your patience with others is seen in what you worry about. Now, wait a minute. How does that connect with my impatience with others? When you worry about things, you start to distrust others. You think maybe that you know better or your ability is better than the ones that you don't trust. So you begin to distrust their motives. You begin begin to distrust their ability. You see what happens there? We become impatient with other people because we're looking at their ability or inability. And what Paul is saying here, he is able to do far above anything that we can ask or imagine. So therefore, be patient with other people. Quit looking at their ability or inability. Look to God's ability. And quit distrusting everybody around you. Submit to the holy, awesome privilege that God saw very little ability in you, gave you His love and grace, which gives you gifts to work out in the church, not so that you can judge how everybody else is doing it, but that you can, to the praise of the glory in the church, help the other generations. Rest in the ability of God. There will be a day where I will disappoint you. There will be a day that you will wonder about the elders or the deacons or your small group leader. And I want to say to you, welcome to the church. Let's help one another. Not look at the inability of of a person or an inability in the person that you see but in the ability of what God's doing. Paul is saying, therefore I, as a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live a worthy calling you receive. So be patient with each other, bearing with one another in love. You know what love is. Love is patient. It's verse 1. Love is patient. Love is kind. The other way we live out a calling worthy in the manner, the other way we practice this doctrine of God is able is we make every effort effort to keep unity. 
with patience, bearing with one another love. Verse 3, making every effort, effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. When we rely on our ability, our effort will quickly become naggy, petty, with complaints. We'll start complaining about this or complaining about that. I notice in my life, the more I complain, the more I'm confessing that I trust man more than I trust God. I complain that they're not doing this and they're not doing this and I'm this way and da 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 and, and it's just this shooting people or shooting myself. And every time I'm complaining about something, I am making a very clear confession that I trust man's ability more than God's ability. This disrupts unity and peace. Because he is able, we can live out our calling in a worthy manner, being patient with one another. We can live out our calling in a worthy manner, making every effort to keep peace. And quit complaining and just trusting God, you're able, you know what's... Well, I need to speak my mind. Do you? Because I think this says, now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we seek or think... He knows what's on your mind. Maybe we do need to confront. Maybe we do need to admonish. And yes, all of that is there's a biblical way to do that. There's an unbiblical way to do that. But God knows what's on your mind. He knows what you distrust. He knows what you complain about. He knows what you're worried about. And what we are saying is that, God, you have expectations. What we want to say as a church, you have expectations that far exceed mine. And you're able to meet your own expectations. So I, before I complain, before I attack, before I nag, before I distrust, before I promote this sort of cynical thing within the church, I'm going to just stop, just bow myself and say, God, you are able to satisfy me. And you're able to fix what's going on in here and in here. Because he is able we can pray and trust in a holy God, in a wise God, in a sovereign, omnipotent God, even when we suffer. He is able, so to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever for all generations. Notice Paul's next verse. Therefore I, a prisoner. Paul is making the declaration like, I know he's able to keep me out of this prison. I know he's able to unshackle me and just deliver me outside the prison cell like he did with others. I know that he's what he's done, but for some reason, this is the stage of life that I'm in. He's able to get us out of suffering. And Paul is saying, absolutely he's able. Has he done it? In Paul's case, no. No. In your case, I don't know. So as we close and we begin to think about what the Lord's Supper is, I don't know what you're currently suffering from. I don't know what prison you find yourself locked in. I don't know what sickness is sidelining you, what Addiction is crippling you. I don't know what other scars that have happened to you are, are causing you to think certain ways. I don't know your fa what family situation might be burdening you. I don't know what career job or dream job that has escaped you. I don't know what your dreams are that are beyond you. But like Paul, I want to say to you, God knows he is able 
He is working. That is the beloved truth we see from Scripture. So from now on, when we come together, we say to each other, we're going to help one another. We're going to be patient with you. We're going to be patient with each other. We're going to fight to keep unity. We're going to hope not in your ability. We're going to hope in his holiness, in his wisdom, his strength, and his care. When we come to take the bread and the cup, the juice together this morning, it is our confessional. It is a cry of hope. If you've not been here before, you don't know how we're doing it, um, in a minute I'm going to pray and then I'm going to sit down and then you are, as the Spirit leads you, you're just going to come. We have a station back there, we have a station back there, and we have one right here. And you're going to come and take the cup. There's actually two cups that are stacked on top of each other. You'll take them apart and you'll go back to your seat and as the Spirit leads you, you will take the bread and you will take the cup and you are confessing with me. When you take the bread, you're saying, I declare that my Savior, Jesus, laid down his perfect life for me. I believe it. I declare it. When you take the cup and the juice, you're declaring that our Savior, Jesus, has covered all of our sins by his blood on the cross that was shed for me. You're not declaring it for your neighbor. You're declaring it for yourself. You're saying, I believe this. By taking the Lord's Supper together, you are saying, I will work to be patient and to protect the unity of the church. I want to follow him, and I want to declare with my church, you are able. You have already done a great work on the cross and the resurrection. You are working now, and you will continue to work for my good until you return from me let's pray we declare by the taking of the cup lord that you are what we need You're all we need. And I know, Lord, that there are some that feel trapped, stuck. I know what that feels like. I understand, Lord, but I don't know what they're going through, and I don't know their scars, and I don't know what they keep seeing when they look into the mirror. I don't know what's on their thoughts or what they're imagining. God, you do rescue all of us, Lord from focusing in on our ability or our inability and lift up our eyes to behold the work of the Son of God on the cross. Father, that your plan was to send your Son to live a perfect life, to lay it down for me and that your blood shed, covered all of my inability, all of my sins. And I pray, Lord, that you would do this wonderful work of grace in our lives right now as we confess this hope back to you.